want to get right to it, but I just want to say welcome, everyone. It's great to see everyone here, uh, whether you're a regular or you're visiting. Uh, and also, we have some middle schoolers, and I just want to say again, if you're a middle schooler here, you can be dismissed to the front of the church. Annie is there uh, to take you guys to middle school. But man, what a, what a great Sunday. It's so great to be here with you all. Uh, again, my name is Lev Burray. My wife and I have been attending YCC for a little more than a couple of years now. And uh, I'm just thrilled, thrilled to be with you here this morning. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I believe that we're all here for a reason, right? I say this all the time. We could be anywhere in the world right now, but for some reason, God has us right here together at Yonville Community Church. Amen? And now I'm, I'm excited. I got a, a question to start everyone. Who here has ever bought or been given a lottery ticket? Show of hands few of you. Everyone else, you're a better Christian than us, I guess, whatever. Uh, but the, the lottery, right, it's this game, uh, it's a game of chance, right, based purely on luck. There's no skill involved whatsoever. You spend a few dollars hoping to buy a ticket, have your numbers called, scratch off a couple things, and hoping to win just millions and millions of dollars, huge sums of money. Uh, for the record, I've, I've bought a lottery ticket before. I've been given a lottery ticket before. Um, I don't regularly play games of chance, uh, but there's one game of chance that I do play kind of often, and I want to be transparent with everybody. I don't want there to be secrets between us. I invest a lot of my time into it. I'm not very proud of it, um, but the game is called things I choose to say to my wife. Yeah, not, uh, so, so, some, sometimes I lose, you know, I throw jokes out there, and uh, yeah, it's a, bit, it's a big game of chance. That's, that's the game of chance I like to play quite a bit. But, but the lottery, um, I actually know somebody who's won the lottery, and he, uh, he won a split jackpot of almost $100 million. And, and I asked him, I said, man, like, what do you do with all that money? Like, like, first thing you do. And after hearing his answers, it just got me thinking, like, what would I spend my money on? And I'm sure some of us, there's cars, housing, pay off debts. And I started to actually do some research, and I wanted to see when people win the lottery, what are some of the first things they spend their money on? And I was hoping to find some really incredible stories, some very cool purchases, but once I started to research, I found some information that was actually a little bit more disheartening. I found that one in three, one third of every person who wins the jackpot lottery goes bankrupt in under five years of winning. One in three, 30% go bankrupt in less than five years after winning hundreds of millions of dollars. And so I just started to dig deep into this. Like, why is that the case? How is that even possible? And as I started to read, I saw these answers come up that, you know, people just spend recklessly. They have people around them who would just bother them, friends, family, begging them for money. These things would cause depression. They'd cause anxiety. And so people would be left in this huge scenario where they simply no idea what to do with the money they have. And you may have never won the lottery. You may not have a hundreds of millions of dollars, but I think uh, the same uh, is true for us in a lot of areas of our life. We find ourselves things we have, things we're given, and we don't always put them to the best use. You see, the point I'm making here is Today, I want us to understand that it is essential that we know what to do with what we have. It is a need for us as people, as Christians, that we know what to do with what we have been given. It's this idea that we call stewardship. Everyone say stewardship. Stewardship, it's, it's this idea of knowing how to care for the things we've been given, responsibly using the things that we have. And this is very, 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 very important because as Christians, we know that the Savior of the world, he, he died for the sins of everyone. He died for your sins. He died for my sins. And he hasn't just washed us 
and given us a ticket into heaven, but he has called us to be on mission with him today to restore the And the really cool thing is he has made every single one of us uniquely, perfectly, and has given us purpose and lots of different and resources to accomplish that goal of restoring the world. And so for that reason, it is so important that we steward what we have well, not for the good of ourselves, but for others and for the glory of Jesus. And so, God has given us many things. Some he gives us time, money, resources. He's given us all words. I know, listen, the election's coming up. He's given us a vote to steward well, but then he's made us all uniquely. He's given us unique talents, gifts, characteristics, and they're all meant to be used for God's purpose. They were never supposed to be used for ourselves They're given to us for the good of others and for the glory of God. Stewardship. It's essential that we know what to do with what we have. And so before we dive into stewardship, I want to give you all a biblical definition of stewardship. It should be up here on the screen. Perfect. Stewardship is the responsible use of God's resources to honor God and further God's kingdom on earth. Earth. In fact, if you are taking notes this morning, apart from looking at them on the Church Center app, you can write this down, that stewardship is the responsible use of God's resources to honor God and further God's kingdom on earth. And so today we're going to be studying this idea of stewardship. Now, we're in a sermon series called Restored. Have you all been enjoying the sermon series so far? Sermon series called Restored, Lessons from Nehemiah. And in this uh, series, we're reading through the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. And today, we're going to be picking up in chapter 5, and we're going to see what godly stewardship looks like as God uses us for his plan of restoration. And so if you have Bibles, you can turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 5, is where we're going to be this morning. Nehemiah chapter 5. So, as you, as you flip and turn there, just to kind of give some context and to recap the past couple of weeks and recap chapters 1 through 4. So, the story of Nehemiah takes place at about 400 years before Christ. The Israelites were in exile after the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem, and now we're seeing that sort of in waves, the Israelites are making their way back to Jerusalem. This is kind of where the story of Nehemiah begins. So Nehemiah himself, he is uh, actually an Israelite official, and he's serving in the Persian government. He's the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. And King Artaxerxes grants Nehemiah this request to go back to, Israel, back to Jerusalem and rebuild the city, specifically the city walls and the city gates. And King Artaxerxes also gives Nehemiah plenty of resources to make that happen. And so chapter one, we see that happening. Nehemiah makes his way back to Jerusalem. And then in chapters three and four, he assigns all these different Israelite families a portion of the wall to rebuild. Some he gives part of the wall, some are different gates, but we see all the Israelites coming together, starting the process of rebuilding the wall. And then chapter four, they face some oppositions. Pastor Sam talked about last week, they had enemies that didn't want them uh, to be building or finishing the wall, and they even tried to kill the Israelites. But uh, the Israelites prevailed, they fought through, they stood up for themselves, and they have continued their work in the wall. And all of that leads us to where we are today, the continuation of the story in chapter 5. Are you with me? Good. All right, let's, let's dive in. Nehemiah chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Nehemiah talking, he said, Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields 
our vineyards and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and though our children are yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. In verse 6, he says, When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused rules and officials. So right from the get-go, we see uh, a lot of mishaps. There's injustice. There's a huge problem where the poor cannot afford to buy food. They can't afford to pay for themselves. Uh, and because of that, they're mortgaging and selling everything they have. Right? Their fields, their olive groves, their vineyards, and they're even selling their children into slavery. And then on top of all of that, they're being charged interest. But here's the worst part the poor were indebted to their fellow Jews who were rich. And so in other words, the Israelites, right, they're supposed to be on this collective mission to restore the city of Jerusalem, yet there are these wealthy officials and no who are taking advantage of the poor during their work of rebuilding the wall. And so Nehemiah stops, he, he listens to the poor, and he's outraged by what's going on, and he goes to the nobles and officials them. He says, you have to stop. But notice what Nehemiah does in between those two things. In verse 6 and 7, he says, when I heard their these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. See, after hearing, but before accusing, what does he do? He ponders. Verse 7, I pondered. I pondered them in my mind. And this leads us to my first point. And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Point number one, godly stewardship stops to think. Godly stewardship stops to think. The thing is, Nehemiah had plenty given to him. He stewarded well. Right? He had power. He had authority. He was actually part of the nobles and officials, and he had wealth. But before he exercised anything that God gave him, he stopped to think about how he should use it. And so the question I have for all of us this morning is, how often do you stop and think? How often do you stop and think, God, how should I use what you've given me? God, what should I do with what I have? How should I use it to bless others and to bring you glory? And I'm going to be completely transparent. If you ask me that question, the answer is not enough. Never enough. We live in a world that is dominated by busyness and full calendars, and it's go, 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 go. And what happens is so many of our decisions become automatic. Right? We don't think, we just do. We never take time to stop and think. But look what Proverbs says in chapter 13, verse 16. The psalmist writes, Why do people think before they act? Fools don't and even brag about their foolishness. Wise people think before they act. And this is really important because it seems as though time after time after time, so many of our mistakes and so much of our poor stewardship simply comes from a lack of thinking. Like we don't take a second to just stop and consider, intentionally wonder what we should do with what we have. I, uh, I grew up playing hockey. Any hockey fans out there? I know we have a couple over here. My hockey fans, there we go. Uh, I grew up playing hockey, and some of my favorite time playing hockey was actually in the off-season training. Off-season training, we'd spend our summers, a couple months, and we would simply try to you know, develop our skills, and then we'd also try to develop our uh, fitness and become better athletes. Specifically, we would train for endurance. 
And we do that for two reasons. The first is simply, hey, when, when the game gets going and everyone else gets tired, we still have energy and we now have an advantage over our competition. But the second reason was actually because of a point that my dad, our coach, has taught me growing up. You see, it was when we got tired was when we stopped thinking. And when we stopped thinking, we would make mental mistakes on the ice. We would pass the puck to the wrong person. We'd run the wrong play. We'd skate the wrong side of the ice just because mentally we would stop thinking. You may never have played hockey or put skates on, but the same is true for so many of us this morning. The point is that many of our mistakes, much of our poor stewardship simply comes from little thinking. We never just stop to intentionally wonder, God, what should I do with what you've given me? When we don't think is when we can oftentimes make mistakes and we use our gifts in a way that God never intended for them to be used. And so I want to encourage you this morning, like, just give yourself a chance. Like, give yourself a chance to use what God has given you in the way he designed it to by just stop and thinking. Take a second. Lord, how would you have me use what you have given me for the glory of you and for the good of others? Nehemiah teaches us godly stewardship stops to think. Let's keep reading. We're going to skip a couple verses and pick back up in verse 9. Nehemiah continues as he is uh, kind of calling out these nobles and officials. He says, So I continued, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and men are also lending the people money and grain, but let us stop interest. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses, and also the interest you're charging them, 1% of the money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. Verse 12, we will give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. Okay, pause right there. So Nehemiah rises up as a hero in the story. Right? He sees injustice and he goes to do something about it. He uses his power, he stewards his authority, he stewards his influence to go and make right from something that was wrong. But notice who Nehemiah used his power and his influence and his authority for. One thing's for certain, it was not for himself. In fact, if we go back, we'll see that Nehemiah was also a wealthy person who was lending money to the poor, but he says, stop charging them interest. Nehemiah knew something. He knew that what he had was not for himself, and he used it for others. And this is going to bring us to the second truth that Nehemiah teaches us about stewardship. Again, if you're taking notes, uh, you can write this down. Point number two, stewardship goes for others. Godly stewardship goes for others. Again, notice who Nehemiah stewarded what he had for. It wasn't for himself. It wasn't for rich, wealthy nobles and officials, but it was for those who needed it most, for the others who needed it most. He understood and what we need to understand as followers of God is that our mission as Christ's followers is to further and advance the kingdom of God on earth and that we receive all of our gifts and abilities and resources for personal gain, but instead for the good of others and sharing the hope of Jesus Christ. That's what it's supposed to be for. Godly stewardship goes for others. Ephesians, Paul's letter to, to the Ephesians reminds us that God has given us all very unique gifts, but they weren't for ourselves. Talking about the gifts God gave us, it says they're given to equip 
his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. See, we live in a world that's focused on self. Right, me, myself, and I want more, get more, spend more. This constant climb to, to gain more, climb the rankings in every way imaginable. It's this world where everything is for and from personal gain. But this is just so contrary to the way that God designed us to function. It's not how it was meant to be. Like Ephesians says, God has given us everything to equip his people for works of service. It's not for self, it's for service. So the question we're faced with this morning, it's a simple one, but it's a hard one. Where have you been selfish? Where have you been selfish? What are you using for self-gain? Is it your time? money? Are you using your abilities for your self-interest, authority, your words? Where are we being selfish with what God has given us and who he's made us to be? When we're only focused on ourselves, it's when, it's when we miss the mark. It's when we live in a way that was outside the design of how we were made to be. And here's the thing. God loves you so much. And he made you so much purpose. He's made you to roll on his team. He wants you on his team. But when we use what we have for ourselves, we are sitting ourselves out on the bench. God says, come, be part of my mission to restore the world. He's given us all Many different gifts, but again, they're never supposed to be used for ourselves. They're supposed to be used for others. And when we use them for others, people take notice. When we do things for others, people see what we do, and they experience Jesus as we become the hands and feet of him and get to show his grace, his love, his mercy in the way we fight for and treat other people. And people don't see you. They see you. Jesus. And so for that reason, it is so important that when it comes to stewardship, others. Again, point number two, godly stewardship goes for others. All right, we're going to keep reading. We're going to pick up in verse 14. So just to skip down a couple verses. Picking up in verse 14, Nehemiah continues. He says, Moreover, From the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah until his 32nd year, 12 years, neither I nor my brother ate food allotted to the governor. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Assistants also lorded it over the people. But out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. In verse 17, Nehemiah says, Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table, as well as those who came to us from the surrounding nations. Each day, one ox, six children, sheep and some poultry were prepared for me and every 10 days an abundant supply of wine of all kinds in spite of all of this i never demanded the food allotted to the governor because the demands were heavy on these people remember me with favor my god for all i have done for these people so nehemiah closes out this chapter by letting us know that his heart for justice didn't end here in chapter 5. He was actually appointed governor, given even more power, more, and again, for the next 12 years was governor. 
He had access to luxury like you would never believe, but he chose not to participate in it because the demands were heavy on the people. Even though he could have indulged, almost rightfully so, like all of the governors did before him, he chose humility, to stay humble, participate it. And why? Again, it says, because the demands were heavy on these people. And so when it comes to stewardship, what we've been doing, God did not call us to fit in, but to stand out. And just because you can, doesn't always mean you should. Even though Nehemiah was put in this position of power, he chose to stay humble. And this leads us to the third and final point that Nehemiah teaches us about stewardship. Again, lastly, if you're taking notes, again, you can write this down. Point number three, godly stewardship continues in humility. It stops to think, it goes for others, and then it continues in humility. What this means is that Christians shouldn't pursue a life of more and more our own self-gain, our own self-benefit, because we recognize that nothing in this world was ours to begin with. Nothing. And the Bible is clear about the entirety of the scriptures. Romans chapter 11, verse 36, talking about God, it says, for from him and through him are all things. Colossians 1 verse 16 says, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And one of my favorites in Psalm 24 verse 1, it says, the the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all all who live in it. When it comes to stewardship, knowing what to do with what we have, and and this idea of continuing in humility, it's understanding and everything we have, internal and external, comes from God and God alone and is a tool that he has given us to you, to us, his kingdom. I want to say that again to get this in your minds. To walk in humility is understanding that our lives and everything we have, internal and external, comes from God and God alone and is a tool that he has entrusted to you for his kingdom. John Wesley was an old English pastor. Does anyone remember John Wesley? Uh, he, he lived in the, in the 18th century, and uh, there's a famous story of him where uh, 1700s, he, wa- he was out one day, neighbors came up to him and said, John, we're so sorry to tell you. down." And he looked at them and said, that's impossible. And they said, no, John, like, we're, we're not joking. We're not messing around like we saw your house that went up in flames and there, there's nothing left. We're so, so, so sorry. And again, he said, that's impossible. Third time, they pleaded with him, John, please, we saw your house go up in flames. It's burned to the ground. It's ash. It's rubble. There's nothing left. And he stood up and said, that is impossible. I don't own a house. And he continued to say, The thing was, yes, I was living in a house, but that was God's house. That was God's house. He just put me in it. He just let me take care of it. So if God wants to burn that house, that's his problem. He'll put me somewhere else. And I hear that story, and sometimes I kind of think like, you know, man, why got to overly spiritual about things. Like, can't you just say your house burned down? Like, it, it, it burned down. John Wesley understood something that we need to understand today, that everything we have is not actually ours. It's given to us from God, and he's entrusted it to us to steward it. And the beauty of this truth 
that everything is God's and we're just stewarding it comes when you understand that God is in control and he owns it all and he loves it and it takes so much weight off of us because some of us, myself included, would lose our minds if we lost our cars or our houses, our time, or our influence. We can let go of what we have and grab hold of God and his provision and his presence, we will manage well. We will give well. We will steward well, and we will live till the day that Jesus returns. Stewardship is about humbly exercising our God-given dominion over his creation. And when we do that, we humbly reflect the image of our creator, the image of our savior, Jesus Christ, for his plan of restoration. So point number three, godly stewardship continues in humility. And as we prepare to close, you may not have won the lottery. You may not have access to hundreds of millions of dollars, but it is without question that God has blessed each and every one of us beyond compare. And I'll start with the truth that God loved all of us so much, you and me, that he sent his one and only son to die for our sins, that we would be made new and we can spend eternity in heaven with our creator. So we already have everything we need. And so when you take a second to look around you, you'll see that God has given you on top of that more than you could possibly imagine. More than you could possibly imagine. Things that God has entrusted to you. Is it words? Is it time? Is it money? Is it influence? Things God has entrusted to you to steward well all for the name of Jesus and his mission to restore the world. And so in summary, when we think about stewardship, right, this idea of choosing what to do with what we have, choosing what to do with what God has given us, Nehemiah teaches us three things. That godly stewardship stops to think, godly stewardship goes for others, and godly stewardship continues in humility. Now, there's a lot of us here today. Some of us, maybe you're, you're a new Christian, or maybe you've been following Jesus for a long time, or maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus. Maybe you don't have a personal relationship with Christ. You're, you're not a Christian. If that's you, I want to leave you with this. Every single decision that we make matters. But the most important decision we will ever make in our entire lives is whether we choose to follow Jesus Christ. Believing in Jesus not only changes our life on earth, but it determines our life for eternity. Those who believe and follow Jesus will join with him one day in heaven. Romans 10.9 says this, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Choosing to believe and follow Jesus changes everything. Not only saved for eternity, but we get to have relationship with Jesus today. And everyone who's sitting here or can hear my voice, he is waiting for us with arms stretched wide, calling us by name, son, daughter, come home, come home. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We're so grateful for what you did for us on the cross, Lord, that you made us new, that when there was nothing we could do to save ourselves, God, you took our sins in our place. And God, with that, you have called 
on your team and on your mission to restore this world. And God, I pray that you give us boldness. God, I pray that you give us wisdom and discernment to what you have given us for your glory. God, would nothing in this world matter but the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you stir our hearts to live for you. I pray that you stir our actions and our decision-making to live for you and reflect your goodness and your love and your mercy. And God, everyone who's here, I just pray that you bless them. God, that we would stand as a church that would mutually edify each other to do kingdom work together as the body of Christ. God, day by day, would you fill us with your love, your mercy, the encouragement, and again, just that boldness to go and do your work. Let us be the hands and feet of Jesus, God. We love you. We thank you for who you are and what you've done. We pray this all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.